I'm excited as well as truly inspired to listen and learn about Black Angels, the Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. I've been a nurse for over 35 years and love to learn all about um, inspiring stories that changed healthcare. Today's event will bring us a historical journey that our special guest, Virginia Allen, the last black angel, endured in New York that has been completely erased from history, but not anymore. The story is alive today because Maria Smalios captured Virginia Allen's journey, along with so many of us we continue to keep history alive, learn from these historic events, and help change the inequities that we all know exist. The School of Nursing wants to thank everyone who helped bring this event to Hofstra. Dr. Barnes, I have to give a shout out to Dr. Barnes from the School of Nursing. She had an emergency and is not able to join us, but I know she is here in spirit. Um, she was instrumental, as I mentioned, in bringing the story here to the School of Nursing and us bringing this out to Hofstra. I also want to thank my amazing ideals team, Dina Kadori and Jessica Fernandez, couldn't do this without them, um, and all of the departments that helped, the history department, the popular the Department of Population Health, School of Health Professionals, the Intercultural Department, the Bookstore, Public Relations, and the students from the Nursing School of Nursing represented here today. There's many of them, but we also have Jessica Myers and Taylor Liverpool who will be helping us, and all the other departments that made this possible. And of course, you guys, the audience, to understand, you understand the importance about this topic and how we need to keep it alive. So the event will start with our special guest, Virginia Allen, and our signature speaker, author Maria, followed by a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Martine Hackett, who's chair of the Department of Population Health, and our panelist, Dr. Aisha Wilson-Carter, Assistant Director of Equity and Inclusion. Did I get that right? Executive. Executive. I knew it was something. OK. <laughs> Dr. Ibrahim Kere, Director of Health Science Program. Dr. Katrina Rochelle Sims, the Assistant Professor, Department of History, and our Dean at the School of Nursing, the Hofstra School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies, Dr. Renee McLeod. Hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> so quickly for the introductions. In 1947, Virginia Allen, inspired by her Aunt Edna Ballard, who was a nurse at Staten Island in Sea View Hospital, left her childhood home in Detroit. Though only 16 years old, Virginia Allen set on a journey that would involve her in one of the 20th century's major medical breakthroughs. She is one of the last living black angels, and, and how did we give, get that name? A name given to patients um, of the black nurses that were recruited to staff Staten Island Seaview Hospital at the end of the 1920s. Initially working as a nursing assistant, her co-workers became her family. Here she is in New York, all alone along with her aunt. She later pursued a degree in nursing school, graduating with honors, followed by a degree in labor relations, which allowed her to advocate for service employees. She did return to patient care and then retired in 2005. After retirement, she volunteered her time at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. She's a founding member of the National Council of Negro Women and serves on numerous boards and has received numerous accolades from community stakeholders. She enjoys music, art, and theater, and she told us today, traveling. Um, and this is a quote from her. One of my main beliefs is that this world is all we have, that it is our duty to care for one another with love. And Maria Smelios was born and raised in New York City. In 2016, she worked as developmental editor for Springer Science. She learned about this extraordinary story and was determined to tell it. She holds a master's degree in American literature and religion from BU, Boston University, where she was a loose scholar and taught in the religion and writing program. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Narratively, The Forward, Lit Hub, Writer's Digest, Dame Magazine, 
magazines, The Rumpus, and other publica publications. So I want to thank both of you for joining us today and sharing your journey. Without further ado, I turn the program over to our guest speakers panel and Dr. Martine Hackett. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Hofstra University and Northwell Health and the Department of Nursing and all of you who have come out to hear us and hear about this remarkable story that I had the serendipitous, it was a serendipitous moment when I found the story. Um, it came from a line in a book that I was editing that the cure for tuberculosis was found at Seaview Hospital in Staten Island. And I loved infectious disease, and I loved New York, and so I Googled it. And alongside it was an article about Miss Virginia Allen and this cohort of black nurses called the Black Angels. And so I kind of went down a rabbit hole, and one thing led to another, and then it led me to this story. Um, what I want to do right now is set the story up for you so you can understand why these nurses were called up and what they were facing when they came to Seaview Hospital. And so I'm going to read the first two pages of the book, which sets that up nicely for our discussion, which will happen after. The call for nurses. No one knew exactly how it started or who set it in motion. But in the spring of 1929, suddenly, inexorably, the white nurses at Seaview Hospital began quitting. One by one, they hung up their uniforms and walked out. Their reasons varied. Many of them were weary of the long commute from Manhattan to Staten Island and the successive days of 12-hour shifts. Some cited the chronic mental and physical toll their job demanded, but most were leaving to escape tuberculosis, the great white plague, the robber of youth, the captain of the men of death, and its victims, the, quote, incurable, infected, indigent consumptives. That's who came to Seaview Hospital, New York's largest municipal sanatorium. On its floors, hundreds of patients lay in iron frame beds, languishing, their bodies swarming with millions of arrogant microbes that gnawed at their lungs, kidneys, and tongues, their spines, bones, and brains. All day long, they sweated and groaned and cried out. They coughed and choked and spit up blood, each hack sending swarms of live germs onto bedpans and sheets, tables, chairs, and doorknobs. The bacteria landed on walls and nightstands and window shades. It drifted under beds and down hallways, slinking into every room and corner of the ward. It was always present, swirling, lurking, waiting to strike anyone who wasn't already sick. And all it took was a single inhalation. Over the years, the nurses had watched their colleagues fall ill. They saw how their faces turned ashen, how their eyes burned from a fever that climbed and climbed, and how their skin exuded a sickly odor that no amount of washing could eradicate. Mm -hmm. Some recovered, at least temporarily. Others died in the wards where they once worked, mouthing, God in heaven, or no, 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 or nothing at all. These days, as the city thrummed and churned and grew, Working white women had plenty of options for jobs that would not kill them. Sales clerks, cashiers, stenographers, secretaries, and telephone operators who worked the switchboard at the New York Telephone Company's new headquarters, a soaring Art Deco skyscraper, the exact opposite of the dark and sprawling sea view. As the weeks passed, the exodus at Seaview became impossible to ignore, and soon word reached the new commissioner of health, Dr. Shirley Wynn. A dapper gentleman who was dedicated to his job, Wynne had reorganized the city's infectious disease hospitals and was currently focused on a massive public health campaign aimed at eliminating a different disease, diphtheria, a bacterial infection responsible for killing thousands of New York's children each year. Months before, doctors had unveiled a vaccine, but previous mishaps with anti-diphtheric drugs had left parents hesitate to vaccinate their children. Frustrated, Wynn began marketing it, quote, in the same manner as chewing gum, a second family car, or cigarettes. Leaflets announcing its safety were slipped in with phone bills, billboards, and illustrated posters went up. 
and health mobiles, renovated snow removal trucks, retrofitted with refrigerators to store the vaccine, fanned out into the neighborhoods. Inside, a nurse, fluent in each area's predominant language, encouraged parents to vaccinate their children. But the staffing shortage at Seaview presented Wynn with a different crisis, one health mobiles and vaccines couldn't fix. Tuberculosis had no cure. And so begins these, this anxious rush to fill the thinning ranks, and they begin to call up black nurses from the South. Thank you. I'd love to hear, Ms. Allen, what, in hearing this um, reading, which I'm sure you've um, been uh, exposed to the way that this story has been told over the years, how do you react to hearing about this? Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I thank Maria for writing the book. She did a beautiful job. I would recommend that every student nurse read the book. Not that others should not, but nurses especially should read it. Did that answer your uh, question? Sure. <laughs> And tell us, um, tell, would you mind sharing with the audience what your experience was at Seaview? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to Seaview right out of high school. My aunt, Edna Sutton Ballard, was a registered nurse, and I aspired to be a registered nurse. And uh, I got permission from my parents to go live with her and go to school. And in the meantime, I got a job at Seaview Hospital as a nurse's aide, which gave me a foundation for the rest of my work life. It was a very um, strict orientation and I heard someone say, and it was true, I passed my nursing with flying colors. And if I must say so, I think I was a pretty good nurse. <laughs> Excellent. And how long were you there? I was there for approximately 10 years. Wonderful. And looking back now, I mean, did you have a sense when you were there that you were part of history in the making? No, never even gave it a thought. I was there to take care of the patients that were assigned to me, which I enjoyed tremendously. I work with children, and being very young, I identified with them, and uh, it was a very pleasant experience for me. Because in the book, the sense of the uh, work environment was of danger. Uh, the idea that these nurses um, uh, had you know, left these positions in part because of the fear around tuberculosis. You didn't have that fear. No, I didn't. I wasn't sophisticated enough to know that um, tuberculosis was so deadly at that time. And Maria, Not until I went to nursing school and really studied pathology did I realize. So you mean you were working in the wards as a nurse's aide, working directly with patients with tuberculosis without a real idea of its way that it had you know, killed millions of people and how contagious it was and all the other dangers associated with it? Luckily for me, I had um, excellent training in the orientation. The nurses were well-trained, and they trained us isolation technique. I will be 93 this shift this long had I not followed instructions 
and adhered to isolation technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about some of that context in terms of, you know, Virginia coming up to be able to do this role with even that limited knowledge of what we understood were the causes and the ways that tuberculosis can be um, uh, uh, you know, addressed. That Was that typical, that people were not aware of what they were getting themselves into? Well, I think when the nurses first started coming up in 1929 and 1930, they were very well aware because tuberculosis loomed large. It's, it was probably... At the time, one in seven were dying of tuberculosis. It stirred people's most potent fears. We have to remember this was the pre-antibiotic age. There were no antibiotics for anything. You could get a cut, and then you would die. Um, and so they were very well aware of how tuberculosis had not just ravaged the community, but ravaged the world globally. In New York City specifically, tuberculosis, at the time, the rate had gone down to killing 5,000 a year annually. But the nurses who were coming up from the Jim Crow South, it was rampant. So for example, where Virginia's aunt came up from Savannah, Georgia, tuberculosis was killing people. It, it, tuberculosis is not so much a medical disease as it is a social disease. It has always been a disease associated with poverty, with people living an immoral or sinful life. And so people down south, as people here in New York, the community that it affected the most was the immigrant community down in the Lower East Side, um, were people who were living in impoverished conditions. And so they were very well aware of what was happening when they came up mm -hmm. um, in terms of the infectious aspect of the disease. After, I think, when Virginia came up, she was young, you know, 16 years old. I imagine my daughter's 13, and I think, my God, in three years, how would you ever go and work in, that, in those conditions? And when you put it in those terms, you really realize that I taught high school, too. 16-year-olds, we always used to say, they look like us, they talk like us, but they don't think like us. They have this idea that they are infallible. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, and Virginia could talk for herself, if that was any different for a young 16-year-old in 1947 in the glory of post-war New York City. You know, It was your first job, right? Virginia? Yes. And did you have that confidence when you came up? Um, I came to New York from Detroit, Michigan. I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Not at that age. Mm -hmm. I sort of awakened when I left my aunt's home to work, uh, to live in the nurse's residence. During that time, um, relatives used to give their relatives the opportunity to live with them and go to school. So my cousin came from Florida, and she took my place in my aunt's home because I could live in the nurse's residence. So I felt a little liberated at that time and a little older. And you'd had that experience of working and knowing what that was like. And so yes. the, there was no more illusions for you. No. Um, I want to um, talk, pivot to our panel. Um, and speaking about tuberculosis, we have um, Dr. Karai, who is our um, director of our um, health science program and is also a physician. Um, even though tuberculosis doesn't have that same deadly image that it did in the 1930s and that it is now preventable and curable, it still remains a global health concern, um, particularly multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And so, Dr. Karai, how would you say that medicine and public health health had used the lessons from TB or tuberculosis treatment uh, and management with infectious diseases like COVID-19? Yeah, thank you um, for this important question, um, Martin. Yeah, um, I 100% agree with you that, you know, that the uh, Tuberculosis, although you know, has been a disease of uh, you know, I would say a disease that spans more than a million years, right? Um, treatment is still elusive, I would say. You know, uh, well, I would say 
um, as far as um, the disease is concerned, it's still a major cause of morbidity and mortality. Uh, let me put it that way, right? Um, so back in 2019, tuberculosis was um, the most common cause of death, you know, from infectious disease um, worldwide. And in 2022, tuberculosis um, was ranked by the WHO as the second most common cause of death um, from an infectious disease following COVID-19. So it's still <clears throat> an important cause of death. Um, uh, so, but now, what about COVID-19? Um, how does the experience with tuberculosis um, uh, kind of support the management of COVID-19 from the clinical and the public health aspects, right? I think that is that is your question, Martin. Um, I'll say through a variety of ways. First, um, the significance, right, of early detection. I, th I think we learned that from tuberculosis. Um, so besides being a physician as well as an epidemiologist, I'm also an immigrant. I came from Nigeria where um, tuberculosis is considered endemic. So I have um, treated patients uh, with tuberculosis. Unfortunately, I have lost relatives uh, from tuberculosis. So um, it's important that the disease is diagnosed early and treated early. With COVID-19, um, we have seen the significance of screening for the disease early and treating um, COVID-19 as well, you know, timely treatment of COVID-19. Um, public health measures, uh, I see some alignment there as well. Um, so from, uh, you know, the isolation, for example, um, with uh, TB, both are respiratory diseases, right? They are both respiratory infections, just that COVID is caused by a virus, whereas uh, um, tuberculosis is, is caused by a gram-negative uh, bacteria, right? But it's, uh, they share in common in terms of being um, a, respiratory, a respiratory disease. And, and for that reason, um, it's, uh, I, I see the significance, right, um, of, let's say, tuberculosis in uh, acknowledging the, 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 the treatment um, of, of COVID-19, if, if I will put it that way. So in terms of the, um, what I actually feel um, we could learn from TB and apply it to COVID-19, and which we have done, is, the, is that we have the social component social vulnerability component. Mm -hmm. So it's a social disease, quite all right, because the occurrence, the distribution of the disease is non-random, is not evenly distributed. <clears throat> so individuals are susceptible. They are more likely to develop COVID, um, um, for example, tuberculosis, and progress you know, to dying from the disease, developing complications. Um, but we also have to consider the social factors, right? They are more likely to advance into developing a complicated disease and dying from the disease, um, mainly because of their susceptibility to, um, let's say, for example, because they have poor access to care, they have poor housing conditions, they live in overcrowded neighborhoods, right? But we know that the bacteria on its own for tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, is actually spread, you know, it's airborne. So um, isolation, you know, um, whenever there is um, uh, an individual lives in an overcrowded neighborhood, there is a chance that transmission could go rampant and what have you. So there is a lot of alignment there as well. So the public health um, measures, right, from the isolation to uh, social distancing to, to the lockdown, we see, uh, you know, some alignment there with uh, COVID-19 and TB as well, yeah. And as you mentioned, the fact that this is still something that affects um, vulnerable populations more uh, distinctly. Yes, exactly. 
Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit of the context um, that is um, highlighted in the book around something that brought uh, Ms. Allen to New York uh, City is the idea of the practices of recruiting young women from the South to work at Seaview Hospital uh, in New York City. And um, this is an area that uh, Dr. Sims uh, does research in, and so I think that she um, can provide a very valuable context. Um, so can you describe how this process worked and who was recruited for these positions? Of course. First, I would like to say uh, thank you so much for the book. I enjoy reading the narratives as someone who spent quite a bit of time in the archives, uh, interviewing individuals like you, Dr. Allen, uh, hearing from your own words, from your own experiences, the ways in which the healthcare industry provided access, but also established some barriers that you kind of had to cross. And so for me, it was a joy. And to your earlier statement, Dr. Allen, you aspire to be a nurse in part because there were not many options for black women, especially coming out of the South, who wanted to do something other than share crop or tenant farm, right? You could be a teacher or a nurse. And what I think is so important about this work, my own research, many other individuals who have really put forth the experiences of black women nurses is that, um, quite frankly, public health care policies in the United States have relied almost exclusively on the very cheap labor of young black women mm -hmm. who were 16 years old, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. who answered the call and put their very bodies on the line to care for individuals doing it out of a sense of duty, yes, but also it was aspirational. They wanted to establish and have a sense of economic independence, a sense of economic freedom, right, that allow for them to have, right, comfort and stability, access, liberty, equality, all of those ideals, right? And so what many of the hospitals would do whenever they needed to address a very real issue which was a shortage in labor, they would put advertisements in newspapers. And those newspapers, of course, were consumed and read by individuals throughout our nation, but it, particularly in the South. Um, they were receiving these messages from newspapers like the Chicago Defender, the New York Tribune, right, the Washington Bee, mostly black newspapers, uh, receiving these images that the North and the West were sort of lands of opportunities for them. So again, I am not surprised uh, to hear Dr. Allen's comments. I was um, uh, very much sort of entranced by these testimonials because it is important for us to contextualize that these experiences, right, in terms of the patients who some of them died, right, but they did so with a level of dignity and a level of care um, when they were away from their families in this uh, facility in Seaport. Um, they did so at the hands of black women who were not able to access all aspects of American society equitably. Right. Um, many of them were paid a significantly lower wage, despite the fact that, again, this work was a very threat to their own lives. Many of them were being stigmatized when they entered public spaces to spend that hard-earned cash at local stores, sitting on buses. Right. So I think it's really important that we understand right, in our elevation of individual women like Dr. Allen what they truly experienced, right? And how this was, this being nursing, um, the field offered and promised them opportunities that it came with a burden, a bit of a cost. Um, and some of that was uh, uh, them having to deal with things like um, segregated lunchrooms, dining halls, segregated housing. Um, being pushed back into the margins of society and public spaces, and again, those rail cars and those buses. So we know that nursing offered them opportunities, but it did not solve all of the problems, the sort of black plight in the United States. Wonderful. Um, 
Dr. Wilson Carter, um, the how did the experiences of the black nurses at Seaview Hospital, um, sort of continuing on thinking about um, what Dr. Sims mentioned, uh, how did that exemplify the damage that actually a lack of diversity can have in the workplace? And what can we learn about the importance of inclusion in the workplace, taking that this sort of historical uh, example into current uh, uh, context? Yeah, um, I think the contextualizing it is so important, as Dr. Sim said. And so I do. I want to thank you, Maria, for writing this book and telling the stories of these magnificent women like Virginia Allen, um, who played such a pivotal role in in history. Um, I, I think the simple answer is that. We can solve problems, we can address issues, um, we can create innovative solutions that meet the broader need of um, the majority of the population only when we work together and we collaborate with um, a diverse group of people with from different backgrounds, with different experiences, expertise, perspectives, and ideas. Um, and when we do that and we have that diverse group, we can really start to address right the world's problems. Um, but not doing so has a price. And I think that's really like the way you told those stories, I think, was so important because it really resonated with me bringing it to exactly what's happening today, right, and some of the things that are going on. So I think the stories of um, the narratives of the Black Angels can teach us about today is really that there's a high cost to pay for inequities and discrimination, right? Um, in healthcare specifically, that cost is time and lives, right? And so we think about all the lives lost and all the time wasted um, due to just discrimination, um, inequities, and really, frankly, the lie of supremacy, right? And so what I mean by that, when we think about the lie of supremacy, and um, I think here in this uh, book, it amplifies that things are meant only or reserved only for certain groups of people. Right, and um, I, I think back to chapter 24, The Prisoner, which I mm -hmm. think was amazing because in that chapter specifically, um, you talk, uh, you, you kind of retell the story behind Nazi prisoner of war being here in America. And these prison of, prisoners of war, Nazis, during the war, um, were here in America being taken care of afforded liberties, luxuries that were excluded to black people in this country. And to really, that that really, yeah. I, you know that, but hearing it, right, and seeing and reading it again really kind of like hits home. And uh, I think we talked, Martine, mm. how sobering something like that, that that fact I think is. Think very much this. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Hold on, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to add to that chapter to to illuminate something. That chapter, um, it's a story about one of the other nurses, Missouria, um, who came up from this very hardline Jim Crow town, Clinton, South Carolina. She went through Howard University, and she arrived at Seaview Hospital. And during the war, black nurses were not allowed to serve overseas. And so what they did was they dispersed them to all these POW camps around the country. And these were very, 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 um, a, a lot of them were high level, dangerous Nazi criminals. And they were able to go work in farms in these towns. They were treated, you know, they were able to sit at the whites only counters. And so in Staten Island, what was happening was there, the boats were coming in to Staten Island with the prisoners of war and American soldiers, and they were being sent to a hospital called Halloran Hospital, which was a couple of miles from Seaview. The ones who had tuberculosis were sent to Seaview. And so the family told me this story, and it was corroborated by a nurse who had worked under Missouria. This Nazi POW lands on the men's ward, which was described to me as... The, he said to me, think of a bar on St. Patrick's Day when everyone's two or three drinks in. Mm -hmm. It was bawdy. It was rough. There were, you know, people who were angry. They were there for years. People at CVU stayed anywhere from, you know, the minimum a year. I read a medical card, 1,113 straight days at CVU. And so... With this particular situation, the story was so harrowing in many ways, but 
this prisoner of war ends up on this ward, and he hates Missouria. And he makes her life miserable for months and months. And then he tries to kill her by spitting on her and tells her, I hope you get sick. And what struck me was this was one of the most reviled human beings in America, a Nazi prisoner. And he finds the one person that the United States considers beneath him, a black nurse. And when I thought of it in that context, I was, it, it kind of left, you know, when you get that moment where you're like, oh my goodness. And I spoke at length to the family about this and she never had really spoken about it. And she, they, she showed up for work for months and months. It almost went on for a year before he left. And I just wanted to add that context that he managed to find one person that the country hated more. And it was the woman who was taking care of him while he was dying in a foreign country. And so that is the extent to which you know, these nurses, you know, encountered this type of racism, but also this type of dangerous situation every day. There was a lot of violence on the on those wards, particularly the men's ward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thank you for that, because and then you went on to talk about other uh, areas and and how well they were being treated in places like Texas and mm -hmm. down south. And, and it really it really did hit me. And I, I think it hit me. Um, mostly because I started thinking about these stories and, and I think that that's what the Black Angel does as well as like other accounts like so much of our uncovered history that we're all learning um, when we're learning about American history, things that were never told to us or kept secret. Um, I think what they all do is really help us kind of realize that the injustices of the past are not really in the past. Right, they have a resounding impact on our lives today. Um, and and I, I think about you being here right now at 93. I think about my mother, who was born in 1948, and she's literally working right now doing taxes. Um, so the, these things are 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? Um, and so it's also the idea of when we're thinking about what's happening today, when organizations and institutions start to acknowledge, right, the past and the injustices and maybe notice that, you know, for the last 50, 100 years, we've only hired certain um, people or gave um, opportunities to certain kind of people because of injustices, right, um, in the past and, and, and laws. So now they want to intentionally do something about it. And that intentionality of diversifying their workforce or their institution or whatever it might be, is looked at as discriminatory against white people. And um, that, that kind of like hits me because if wanting to intentionally diversify your workforce or your organization or institution for the sheer value of it, right, that I described before, it is a sheer, you know, point A to point B value in diversifying, um, it can be discriminatory or seen as discriminatory means that you are working under the assumption and the belief that all jobs, all opportunities, all benefits and membership belong to someone else, right? They And specifically in the case here, they belong to white people, specifically white men, right? Mm -hmm. And if a woman, an African-American, or insert any other like historical minoritized person or group there gets a job, gets an opportunity, or gets a membership, that they took it away from their rightful owners. Mm -hmm. And so if that's an inherent belief, then that means that you are buying into supremacy, right? You are bought into the lie. Um, and and I, I can say a couple more things that maybe I'll get around to, <laughs> but I, I think that that was really um, some of the parts of that thinking about how we inherently um, have bought into that or suffer from that, right? Um, and, and then the idea that diversifying means that there's a loss of qualification or expertise, mm -hmm. even as, right, we take black women right now being the most educated group um, in America right now. We did everything that we were told to do, and we're being villainized for it. We're being dismissed, our work being devalued, right? What does that mean um, for us, regardless, right, of how much we think we've overcome? Um, 
it's just the idea that subconsciously, if anyone does believe those things, that we're losing quality, quality by diversifying, that that is an inherent belief, even subconsciously, in the superiority mm-hmm. of other people. Yeah, and I think what we can see in the book is that that is patently wrong, right? Mm-hmm. When yeah. we see the efforts that were done by the Black Angels to do work that um, clearly no one else was able to do. And Dr. McLeod, speaking of that, that makes me think about, um, uh, you, you mean, you're calling them angels, right? So this is sort of the portrayal or a way of really um, highlighting the work of nursing. Mm-hmm. And the way that that has changed over the years, um, what do the stories portrayed about the Black Angels tell us about the nursing profession um, and, and how it's changed uh, in the United States? Um, if we think about this, we also, you know, uh, in the book, it highlights how the nurses participated in the research to be able to identify the cure for tuberculosis. It makes me think about nurses involved in clinical research, you know, today. So can you tell us a little bit about your reflection on, um, in in terms of, you know, uh, thinking about the stories portrayed in the book and how this reflects on the changes that you've um, seen in the nursing profession? I I think like Dr. Wilson Carter, I could spend probably the next hour, and Ms. Collins, who helps us stay on time, would probably kick me out of this room. She would not like that. She wouldn't like that. But I'm indebted to Virginia Allen, and I want to thank you. And I especially, I look around this room, and you know who I'm going to point to. Stand up, because you will be two of our nurses that are graduating from the first class. So, and I see many more of you hiding out in the back, too, from the next classes. We wouldn't have a school of nursing if it wasn't for Virginia Allen and if it weren't for angels. We always talk about public health, and we talk about Florence Nightingale, but I'm embarrassed to say that I'm a native New Yorker. My parents immigrated to New York from the South in 1964. I'm the only one of five born here in New York, and yet... I lived a stone's throw away from Staten Island and never knew. Mm -hmm. So what this teaches us is that we have to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at a colleague and a friend, the great Dr. Sandra Lindsay. Please stand. Because so much of what we saw play out in Seaview, we saw play out here in New York again as we had the first surge for covid So you ask me my thoughts. My thoughts are that women such as Virginia spent a five-hour round-trip commute. Living in Manhattan, commuting to Staten Island to care for the poorest, the most uncouth, the most immoral, the most indigent, for two reasons. It was the opportunity to take care of an integrated population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we take that for granted, right? That when I gave birth to my daughter, the person next to me who was in my room was of another color and didn't think twice of it. Can we imagine in the 1940s that was not the case? In fact, Health and Hospitals Corporation is a very large corporation here in New York bringing nurses in into Harlem Hospital, into Lincoln Hospital, learning to care and be at their highest level. And yet only four of those 29 hospitals at the time hired black nurses. Mm -hmm. Only 260 black hospitals existed in the country while there were 6,000 white hospitals. So zip code, zip code, zip code determined how we were cared for. And you know what? during COVID, between 2019, 2020, until now, 2024, you know what determined the best care? Zip code, zip code, zip code. Because I got to have the luxury of being at Northwell Health and always having a mask, always having protective equipment. But in health and hospitals, right in the same five mile radius, people were standing outside in black plastic bags. Those people, nurses. 
those people, the people who came and cleaned, those people who came and... We put ourselves at risk, and we continue to put ourselves at risk for illnesses that we do not know what is going to happen 100 years from now. So I hope, Ms. Allen, that I get to 93 and that I am still here to talk and that the students don't kick me out and say that Dean is still here. <laughs> um, but it's really, really important that we realize that nurses traveled, that they endured racism, mm -hmm. that they endured sexism, that they endured verbal abuse, that they endured physical abuse, that they were told that the people that they were caring for didn't matter. And I'm not only talking about then, I'm talking about in the last four years. Mm -hmm. So the distress, the moral distress that nurses carry comes with being an angel. Mm -hmm because only an angel can have broken wings and still fly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you, and yes, Maria. I just wanted to add um, one thing, and I know we're pressed for time, so I'm gonna just kind of wrap it up. Um, something about the nurses being considered expendable, it's what you were talking about with equity. There's a moment in the book where, and I think this puts everything into perspective of how they were perceived when they were called up. Um, the president of hospitals held a meeting in 1933, and there were 300 people at the meeting. Officials and nurses were invited. And this very fierce nurse advocate, Solaria Key, stood up and said, Mr. President, why do you send black nurses to Sea View? And he said, well, we send black nurses to Sea View because, quote, in 20 years, we won't have a colored problem in America because they'll all be dead of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And so that quote, when I had read it, I kind of pinned it to my wall because it framed the narrative. These nurses, in the end, they don't die. And that's the beauty of this whole story. They don't die. They become part of an of a galvanizing moment in global history, which is the cure for tuberculosis. And I know we have to wrap this up, but I will say, in the end, this story for me, when I wrote it, it, it is one of triumph. It is one that shows us there are always people willing to take care of us, people like he, this panel and people in the audience to take care of me. We saw it during COVID. And these women, in doing so, save tens of millions of lives, and they still do. Yesterday was World TB Day, mm. and what was celebrated, yes, it's isoniazid, which is still the gold standard treatment, and hopefully we do have drugs for multi-resistant tuberculosis. That's a whole other story, but what I want to say is they show us the humanity, that the collective humanity that I think we need to return to in today's world, the humanity that wouldn't let nurses work in garbage bags and wouldn't let people stand in the cold when they were sick with a disease you know, that we didn't know what, what, what was happening with them. And, and I saw the line snaking in Elmhurst Hospital. So all I want to say is that they were slotted to die along with the patients, and they didn't. And that is the triumphant part of this whole story. So thank you. And, yeah. and I'm sorry, I'm, I know no, we're over no. time. <laughs> perfect in terms of time. Actually, I think now we're ready for questions. If there are questions from the audience, um, already see some questions over here. Oh, do you want people to come to the center? <clears throat> Sorry, would you mind just going up to the microphone? Thank you. Uh, hello. I'm short. I got to lower this. Um, uh, this question is mostly for Virginia, but of course it's open to anyone on the panel who has some insight. Um, like Dr. McLeod said before, I'm one of the uh, inaugural class nursing students. I'm graduating in a year. And I feel like as student nurses, we wield, we hold so much power um, being a new generation and being able to attend events like this, being able to hear from nurses like you, Virginia. And um, we, um, we like idolize Florence Nightingale as like the mother of nursing, but I feel like you um, and other nurses like yourself are the mother of modern nursing because we overcome, we learn to overcome from you and other people like you. So I feel like my question is how, with the power that we hold, how are we going to wield it? Um, what do, do you have any advice for me and other nursing students um, for what we can do when we graduate? and the years to come after that? That's a big question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. I would, um, 
I would probably tell you to always be true to what you are doing and remember why and to always keep that in the forefront. Why are you a nurse? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we forget there are people who are in it for the monetary reasons and not for the reasons of helping others. So I would say, be true to your pledge. Miss Allen, can you tell them about how you rallied to make sure that black nurses were part of nursing associations and unions? And um, part of my work experience was working um, for 11.99 in local 144. And I was speaking about my experience at first. I felt that nurses should not be part of a union because it's a professional um, category. And um, I single-handedly uh, fought 1199 when they tried to organize the nurses at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, where I worked in the OR, and they lost. And of course, the president of the union wanted to know, how did they lose? They don't lose elections. So I met them, and they convinced me to come and work for them. <laughs> and I always say, there is something more we can learn. So by that door opening for me, I walk through it. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I would say to young nurses. Always take the challenge. It um, broadens your horizon. You're always learning something new or cementing what you know. So I went to work for the union, and I must say, uh, I would say everyone should be represented by a union. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you to Hofstra University for convening this panel. Uh, Dr. Virginia Allen, thank you so much. It's such an honor to meet you. Thanks for paving the way for me as a nurse. I just celebrated 30, my 30-year 30 anniversary as a nurse and for future generations. Um, like Dr. McLeod, um, I was not aware of this story. I was never... I never learned about the Black Angels. About two weeks ago, a friend of mine who is not even in healthcare, but he has a friend, and the friend's mother, Virginia Green, was oh, a yes. nurse yes. as well. Yes. And he sent me a picture at the beginning of um, Black um, Women History Month. And I was so ashamed to tell him that I never heard of it. So I went digging, and I found a story that um, was featured on CBS, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so I posted it on my Instagram. And about a week later, I received the invitation to this event mm. from Hofstra. And I said, absolutely, I need to be here. Took me a little time to find the theater, but I'm happy I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't give up. And it's just such an honor to meet you. Thank you so much. And thanks again for convening this panel. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I must say, I'm very honored to be able to speak to you today and to represent all of those nurses and all of the staff that took care of the patients during that time. Can I just say, I, it, it always strikes me when people are like, oh my goodness, I didn't know this. Don't feel bad. The reason that we didn't know about the story is because 
it was a story about women in science and black women in science, and it's Women's History Month, and did you know that 0.5% of 3,700 years of history is women? That's only 17 years. <laughs> so there's a lot of untold stories out there. And so, you know, the story, I'm from New York City, I'm in this field, right? Like, it just, it circulated in Staten Island in a very... Um, small circle of people. Staten Island is small. They knew it, they kept it alive, Virginia kept it alive. And part of the problem was there were no archives. The nurse's story I built from an oral history for years, and that was one impediment. The other impediment was that the patients who were still alive that were part of the first isonized trials, Dr. Robachek's son gave me his father's archives. That's where those names were. And so there was this culmination of events that happened that you couldn't get to the, the full story. It existed in a very pretty manner. Black nurses came up, helped white nurses, mm -hmm. the cure for TB happened, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but when you start to layer it against the historical backdrop and all of these very punctuating moments in history, then you get an, a more authentic story. But so all I'm saying is don't feel bad. Like most people didn't hear it and partially is, I mean, I think a lot of it is, it is a story of women in science. They were the most most iconic photograph of that day is the patients jitterbugging in the front, snapped by a famous photographer. In the back, you see the black nurses. Mm -hmm. Nobody stopped to ask them anything, ever. Photographers rolled in and out of that hospital for weeks on end. Not one person said, let me ask this nurse. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Robachek, his son, told me, my father said, had it not been for those black nurses, none of this, meaning this, the trials, and this, the hospital, would have been possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an important thing to keep in mind, why are these stories not told, and how many thousands of others untold women's stories mm -hmm. are laying somewhere in people's memories, in their scrapbooks, <laughs> you know, tossed away in some hospital. New York Health and Hospitals is notorious for shoving things in places where they don't belong. Mm -hmm. But you know, we need to think about that. Why are women's history, why do we keep being erased from history or narratives that don't include us but really include us? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say, you know, it's it's amazing when people are like, I didn't know. You you couldn't have known. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to tell it. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, uh, yes, thank you so much, Maria, for making that comment. Um, I'm thinking also part of the reason why we don't know these stories is the individuals who are deciding what is of value to put in those archives are not as diverse, right, or recognizing of the contributions of someone who started as a nurse's aide and then eventually became a registered nurse, right? Um, and so some of that it has to do with one, we're not sharing our resources, right? And I know part of that is protective. My granny has a suitcase full of stuff, right, that she will not give up, um, in part because there may be a question around value, but also the other part of that is individuals who are the curators and archivists, they don't see value in those materials. So it's really up to us. And now that we're in the digital age, you young folks, when y'all go home and hang out with your grandparents, scan those photographs. Mm -hmm. Copy those birth certificates and old um, union cards, right? And my grandmother's nurse's card that I have, like, scan that stuff, right? Be your own personal sort of familial uh, historian. And that's the way we can preserve so many of these stories. I'd like to also say uh, my daughter became a registered nurse. I am a licensed practical nurse. Mm -hmm. And my daughter became a registered nurse, I think, because of me. I would hope so. <laughs> I'm sure. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Yep. So it's not a question. It's a comment oh. that, uh, that Renee probably not going to mention. I've been talking about untold, untold stories. And right outside this library, I was just mentioning it before, um, there's a statue, a Henry Moore sculpture that I'll bet 99% of the people here don't know about. Am I probably right, Renee? You're right. Mary knows what I'm talking about also. 
I, I, I don't need the microphone. <laughs> just a little bit. I have to use the microphone. Yeah, okay. just Dr. Gluck just All right. a little. So, yeah, I'm Dr. Gluck from the um, nursing school. So Renee knows exactly what I'm about to talk about. So does Mary Lemp. Um, so two times during this session, we've heard um, uh, Florence Nightingale mention. Um, there's another nurse. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Right out this, There's a sculpture right outside this building, 30 feet from here, uh, dedicated to a um, black nurse who served with Florence Nightingale. In fact, she was excluded from serving with Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War. Mary Seacole. Mary Seacole. Mary Seacole. Okay, from the West Indies. All right. She's right outside here. And her there's a couple of books about her as well, but you know, we're right here in House Show with a sculpture outside and probably I mean I'm in the middle of writing an article about her, but there's books out there about her. The other thing I'll just mention quickly because we have to finish up is the irony uh, about the same time that uh, Virginia Allen, and thank you so much, um, and you mentioned Brooklyn Jewish. I was born there, and my parents met there, so uh, <laughs> great to hear you mention Brooklyn Jewish. Uh, my dad was a hematologist, oncologist there, and my mom was a secretary, so just, and I, I just, just take a second, I really enjoyed uh, your story, and you're wonderful. Thank <laughs> uh, you. Um, but I was just going to mention the irony that about the same time you were serving, uh, you know, in Staten Island in the tuberculosis wards, uh, starting in 1932, um, there was experimentation on blacks down in Tuskegee. Yes. So while you were going out serving, um, you know, the great irony that uh, there was tremendous indecency um, being, uh, you know, I don't even know what the word would be. Um, you know, people were being exploited and worse. Uh, so there was this tremendous divergence, uh, tremendous irony. Are you putting yourself out, and then these other people basically being experimented on. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the contrast is incredible. Anyhow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Allen. You're so welcome. Okay, and I think we're at the point now where we have um, uh, books for sale, and we have um, the author available to do to sign your copies. And I want to thank my panel and everyone who is here, and thank you so much for this wonderful con conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.